Early in the morning, on May the 27th, 2015, plainclothes policemen started visiting hotels in Zurich, Switzerland, and systematically rounding people up. Seven high-ranking FIFA executives were detained in an early morning raid at a Zurich hotel. The men arrested now face possible extradition to the US, as it was American investigators who launched the probe. For years previously, an investigation carried out by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Internal Revenue Service had been tracking financial irregularities at FIFA, the governing body of world football. Today's news comes as no surprise to you, I imagine. I've been waiting for it, getting a little impatient some years. Today is a day of righteous justice, as far as Mr. Blatt is concerned. He's got away with it, but today the roof fell in. Following this momentous occasion, a stream of indictments had been handed out to individuals involved with the organization. Jose Maria Marin of Brazil, Juan Angel Naput of Paraguay. Each was a top football official in their country, and each has been found guilty of racketeering, conspiracy, and other charges for their roles in what prosecutors described as schemes where sports marketing companies funneled hundreds of millions of dollars in bribes to dozens of football officials. But slowly, the indictments dried up. It seemed like the trail had gone cold. Then, last week, a new indictment was unsealed at a district court in New York. An indictment unsealed on Monday in the US District Court in Brooklyn have revealed new details of alleged bribes paid to FIFA Executive Committee members to gain their votes for Qatar to host the 2022 World Cup. The FIFA corruption trials were back. In this episode, we ask, what has been happening with FIFA's corruption charges over the last five years? And why are they suddenly back on the agenda? This is big news because the case has been quiet for so long and all of a sudden for the first time in almost two years we have new indictments and new charges which makes us believe that this thing we thought is an artifact of history is in fact still alive. Ken Benzinger is an investigative journalist at BuzzFeed and the author of the book Red Card, How the US Blew the Whistle on the World's Biggest Sports Scandal. For those who are watching this, for a lot of people who felt that justice may have been served but not in sufficient quantity, this is a big step forward. Talk us through the events of last week. What happened on Monday the 6th of April in a U.S. district court in Brooklyn? In the middle of a pandemic, really no one expected this to happen. Courts around the country and here in the U.S. have been shut down um, or, or vastly reduced. In fact, that same court was just a few days earlier getting petitions from people to get out of prison to avoid hearings because of the pandemic. So out of nowhere drops an indictment on Monday morning, which is quite surprising. Prosecutors have revealed new details of alleged bribes paid to FIFA executive committee members to gain their votes for Qatar to host the 2022 World Cup. The indictment restated many of the things we already knew about the FIFA case, as people call it, but also brought new defendants into the case and several important revelations that were the kind of proverbial shoes to drop we'd all been waiting for. So for those of us who are nerdy and geeky enough to follow every twist and turn of this case, it was quite an exciting thing. But I actually think it has relevance just for the casual football fan as well. Just to be clear, what is an indictment? So an indictment in the U.S. judicial system is a charging document. It is the government making uh, criminal accusations against an individual or uh, an entity, and it's created by a grand jury. So prosecutors in secret have meetings with a grand jury, which is composed of just like a regular jury of citizens, and they hear evidence, and if they think there's enough evidence to make an accusation, this is not a trial, it's just what the evidence that prosecution puts out, then they do what's called handing down an, an indictment. They agree with the charges of the prosecutor, they sign it, and that becomes a formal criminal charge against someone. And what does unsealed mean in this context? The government, typically, when they make an indictment, it becomes public very quickly, but in certain circumstances, the government, meaning the prosecution, can request to the court that it remain sealed for a period of time. And that's what happened in this case. So the indictment itself actually came down from the grand jury on March 18th, but it wasn't made public until last Monday. 
that can serve many purposes, but often it's because the prosecutors have their own designs about what they want to accomplish between the time the grand jury accepts their proposal for a charge and when they want the public as a whole to know. What were the most notable revelations from the indictment? I would divide the the indictment's revelations into two categories, ones that have to do with FIFA voting processes and particularly over the World Cup, and the other having to do with media rights and some of the biggest corporations in media in the world and their acquisition of football rights. So there's two areas. And in the first basket, you have the news that specific individuals received bribes from Russia and Qatar for their votes in 2010 to be awarded the World Cups. An indictment unsealed on Monday in the US District Court in Brooklyn said Nicolas Leos, then president of the South American governing body Conmebol and former Brazil Federation president Ricardo Teixeira, received bribes to vote for Qatar at the 2010 FIFA Executive Committee meeting. The indictment also alleged that Jack Warner of Trinidad and Tobago, president of the North and Central American and Caribbean governing body CONCACAF, received $5 million in bribes to vote for Russia to host in 2018. These are things that people have rumored about for a long time, particularly Qatar, but this is the first time the prosecutors have actually pointed their finger at specific countries and made specific detailed accusations about such bribery. A government witness in the FIFA corruption trial reportedly said that Fox Sports and several other broadcast networks paid bribes to FIFA for soccer broadcasting rights. The second basket was that three different media company executives were named as having participated in longstanding bribery schemes to bribe football officials in Central America and particularly South America in exchange for ceding rights to major football tournaments over a long period of years, paying millions of dollars of bribes to acquire these rights. So now we're seeing sort of directly laid at the front doorstep of, in this case, among others, Fox, the giant broadcasting juggernaut being accused of its executives basically breaking the law to get television rights for football. We'll talk about the greater details of those cases in a little moment. But first, in terms of the immediate timeline, what's going to happen now? Last Monday, the indictments were made public. And on Thursday, several of the accused parties were arraigned. An arraignment is when someone who has been charged publicly or been charged period, because sometimes it could happen in secret as well, but they make their appearance before the court. The Constitution in the U.S. guarantees people the right to be seen before the judge when they're charged with something. So they held their arraignment and both the Fox executives or former Fox executives pleaded not guilty, as did a corporation that was charged as well. And mind you, it's not Fox, it's a different corporation. And so the next steps are that they plan, at least for now, to go to trial. And so the charged individuals are preparing themselves for trial, which can take a very long time, could take a year, could even take two years for an actual trial to happen. Meanwhile, with the other charges we briefly discussed, they're not truly charges against Russia and Qatar so much as they are explanations of a larger scheme. So there's no specific charges there. What we really see now is moving slowly towards a trial for these individuals. And finally, there's a third media executive who's from Spain who's been charged and presumably the U.S. would be seeking his extradition, which is its own sort of mini trial in Spain to determine whether he would be extradited to the U.S. I want to talk about the history of this because you've already mentioned it's been a really slow process. There was a round of indictments that was released in 2015. There was again some indictments that were released in 2017 and three defendants went on trial in Brooklyn. Why has the process been so slow? I think the simplest answer is a bit cliche, but they say the wheels of justice grind slowly. And I think that's very much the case in this instance. This investigation actually began all the way back in 2010, prior to the vote I mentioned earlier. And so we're we're now coming up towards the 10th anniversary, so to speak, of this case. And this is a particularly complicated case because it involves multiple, multiple countries and it involves money laundering and chasing down obscure transactions across continents is a long and laborious process. Moving potential witnesses, informants and other collaborators back and forth to Brooklyn where the prosecutors are is a long and slow and lengthy process. All of these things can make things move very slowly. Further, things like pandemics don't help either. So we've basically seen a case that has never been in high speed. It's never been done anything but in the most thorough and slow fashion possible. A lot of people felt when they saw these new charges come out, well, this is old stuff. We've been hearing about this now for five years. Is this all we're ever going to hear about is what happened in 2010. But in this case, that seems to be the pace that they've chosen.
I'd like to trace their history because I think it's very interesting. Obviously, the date that sticks in most people's mind is 2015 when those 14 people from FIFA were indicted in connection with that joint investigation between the FBI and the IRS. But as you've mentioned, you know, the history goes much further back than that. What are the most important early moments, do you think, in the drive to uncover FIFA's corruption? There's a, a seed moment when this all begins, which is in the summer of 2010. I'm going to be very brief on this, but there was an FBI agent who was looking for cases about Russia. He was a Russia specialist at the time. He went to London from New York, where he lived, to talk to experts on Russian organized crime, had met three months earlier with a former MI6 agent named Christopher Steele, who was not at all famous at the time. And now, of course, he's quite famous. Christopher Steele, he's the man behind the Steele dossier. He's a former British spy. Steele produced opposition research during the 2016 campaign cycle that allegedly linked the Trump campaign and Russian officials. He met with Steele. Steele was a Russia expert. And a few months later, Steele suggested to the FBI agent, this is in that June timeline, he had to look into FIFA because Russia was doing some funny things with its bid to win the World Cup. That's really how it all began. Within a few weeks, the case was up and running. But that brings us to the next signal date, which isn't for another year, which is when the IRS gets involved. And an IRS agent based in California named Steve Berryman, through sort of a complicated series of things, gets involved in the case. He is able to deliver what becomes the first and potentially one of the two most important cooperators in the case when he, looking at tax records, discovers that Chuck Blazer, who was the general secretary of CONCACAF, CONCACAF being the regional confederation under FIFA that oversees football in North America, Central America, and the Caribbean, this guy in New York had been paying taxes, owed the government a huge debt, had committed tax crimes, and therefore was vulnerable. Former football official Chuck Blazer has admitted in court testimony he conspired with fellow FIFA executives to accept bribes during the process to choose hosts for the 1998 and 2010 World Cups. And the IRS gets him to flip and become the first cooperator in the case. Now, that's moved us to November 2011, um, but we're still a long way from the, the home stretch because after that, they've got to sweep up a series of other cooperators from different countries, including in particularly Brazil, as they move towards the indictment. They conduct surveillance. This is the FBI and the IRS. They are spying on people. They're recording conversations. In 2012, there was an amusing event where they sent Chuck Blazer to the London Olympics and they wired him up and they had him try to get people to admit to being criminals at different events in the Mayfair section of London. Antics continue for years. And finally, all the pieces come together in this famous May 27th date, which is sort of a a watershed, infamous moment in the history of the sport. What happens on that morning? That morning, before 6 a.m. Swiss time, so European time, plainclothes detectives and, and police officers from the Swiss police go into several of Zurich's most luxurious hotels, particularly one called the Bar Alak, which is a five-star hotel down by the river in Zurich, and request to go to different rooms. And they go and they begin arresting people left and right. And they are acting at the behest of the U.S., which has handed down an indictment against these people that has been sealed for about a week as the final preparations were made. Within hours, the entire football world reacted as if an atomic bomb went off. Even by FIFA standards, these are extraordinary developments. At the behest of the U.S. Attorney General, seven senior FIFA officials arrested at the crack of dawn concerning allegations of fraud, racketeering and money laundering. U.S. Attorney General Loretta Lynch says this indictment of 14 FIFA officials allegedly shows corruption that is rampant, systemic and deep-rooted both abroad and here in the United States. The U.S. has moved to arrest some of the most powerful men in the sport. And within days, an incredible series of events follow in which Sepp Blatter, the president, is re-elected and then announces he will resign. And no other topic can be talked about in football. People are fleeing Zurich, those that can, others are put into jail. These distinguished, wealthy football officials are, for the first time in their life, arrested and dragged out in handcuffs in front of the public. It's a complete shock in this world. And now we live in a different kind of news cycle between coronavirus and political upheaval in Europe and in the UK and in the US. But back in 2015, things were a bit calmer. And so this story dominated world headlines for weeks on end. I think most of the summer of 2015 was about the FIFA scandal and little else. So it was really one of the most significant criminal cases we've seen coming out of the US in in decades, probably. So you've mentioned Chuck Blazer already. Another important name, I think, is Jack Warner. Good evening, Mr. Warner, Andrew Jennings, BBC Panorama. This this is only a very polite inquiry, Mr. Warner. If I could have spit on you, I would have spat on you. Why would you spit on me? Because you're garbage. 
Both of them are representatives in CONCACAF. It turns out that this confederation is actually really quite important in FIFA just because it ends up having a huge amount of sway in decision making and, and obviously that kind of thing makes it ripe for corrupt activities. Could you tell us a little bit about the importance of these two men in particular? Chuck Blazer, as many may know, is this outsized figure, a guy from Queens, uh, borough of New York, who is physically immense and his appetites are immense. He was about 450 pounds. I don't know how many stone that is, but a big man, had a big bushy beard and curly white hair, famous for riding around Central Park on a mobility scooter with a parrot on his shoulder. So that sort <laughs> of personality. Jack Warner, in many ways, was extremely different. A slender, very disciplined man from Trinidad who was a former school teacher who went on to become the country's most powerful football official and also a member of parliament in Trinidad and Tobago and finally a high-ranking government minister. I think he reached the post of defense minister at one point. Relatively early in both their careers, they met each other because both their federations, both the areas they worked were part of CONCACAF. It was Blazer who became the mastermind of what would become Warner's big ascent, which is that Blazer got him elected president of CONCACAF. Blazer had the idea that if Warner could assemble a block of all the Caribbean nations, which were numerous, it would be unbeatable within CONCACAF and he could win the vote. He was right. That same ability to shepherd votes that turned out to be Warner's political genius made him incredibly powerful within FIFA, gave an outsized power within the organization. And even though CONCACAF is not the richest confederation by a long shot, that would be UEFA or the one with the longest and most prestigious football history, which would again be UEFA or CONMEBOL, the South American confederation, or the most numerous, which I think would be Africa. It had Warner who could guarantee that it would vote as a block, which meant that it was very powerful in Zurich, where FIFA is based. And he used that power to become a FIFA vice president and to be rivaled only probably by Sepp Blatter, the FIFA president in terms of power. And so for 20 years, Jack Warner was enormously influential in the organization, wielded a great amount of power, and as we learn in this case, used that power very frequently to put money in his pocket under the table to win uh, power and influence throughout the region. It's now nearly five years later. What's happened in that time? So there have been numerous successive indictments. There was another one about six months after the May one, which named a number of other officials and rather amazingly included yet another raid on the exact same hotel where several more officials were arrested. One might wonder what degree of hubris or willful ignorance it takes to have committed crimes of bribery and yet stay in the same hotel at the next occasion. But they did it. And then a number of smaller individual parties were scooped up over the next year in different places. And it all led towards a trial because basically everyone who was charged either ended up in two categories, those who agreed to flip to cooperate and try to get a deal with the prosecution or those who for one reason or another were not brought to the US to face justice because they weren't extradited or they were in countries that don't extradite, such as Brazil, which won't extradite its citizens except for violent crimes. So those people were untouchable. There was only three holdouts, three people in the whole list of several dozen people charged um, insisted on going to trial. And a very loud and flashy trial took place in November and December of 2017. This was of a Paraguayan who had been a FIFA vice president and also um, president of CONMEBOL, the South American Confederation, Jose Maria Marin, who had been president of the Brazilian Federation, and finally Manuel Burga, who was president of Peru's Football Federation. Two of the three were convicted. The third, the Peruvian, was acquitted and he returned to Peru. Those two men were sent to prison. Naput was the former head of the South American Football Federation and was found guilty on three counts, but not guilty on two other counts. Marin, the former head of the Brazilian Football Federation, was found guilty of six of the seven charges against him. After that, everyone sat around essentially waiting for more charges to come, of which there was only one or two very small ones after the trial until this most recent news. So what light did the unsealing of the indictment in New York last Monday shed on what we already know about this U.S. investigation? I think one of the most critical things we learned from this is that the case is very much still a living, breathing, ongoing thing. There had been 
many who felt that the case must have died. Bureaucratic creep had taken over in a case running that long, and many of the prosecutors and federal agents who had been working on the case, law enforcement agents, had either moved on to other areas or retired. So the original two or three prosecutors who had first started the case were long since gone. They were gone before the trial even. The lead IRS agent had retired. The lead FBI agent, I believe, has now retired. So the original starting 11, as it were, is depleted heavily and it's a new generation running it. And many people assumed that would mean that the case no longer had legs. But instead, we see this complicated new set of charges arise and we realize that they still are going for it. So it seems as if the case moves forward. That's probably the biggest takeaway. And the other is that many of the things we've been hearing rumors about for many years, at least according to the prosecutors, are true. And that's uh, that's an important development as well. Do you think this investigation will have any impact on FIFA and the awarding of World Cups in future? Well, I mean, it already has in the sense that after the original indictments, FIFA moved to change its voting for World Cups, the policy, the structure of the the voting. So its governance before was that the members of its executive committee, which were 24 people in a secret room in the basement of FIFA, would vote on the World Cup and it was a secret ballot. Since the indictments, FIFA rewrote that policy, and now the voting is held in public with its Congress, meaning all 211 member nations of FIFA vote for the World Cup. So they've moved that to a public forum and changed the voting procedure. That's an important thing. They also changed the composition of the FIFA executive committee. They call it the executive council. Now it's larger. It's required to have women on it, which it never did before. So there's been some governance reform like that. So there have been changes. That said, many people believe that it's still a a process that is open to bribery and lots of foul play, and there's still a lack of oversight. The trial has implicated major media outlets accused of paying bribes to obtain broadcasting rights, charges they've denied. One former FIFA official says the corruption drama highlights how widespread the culture of corruption is at FIFA and the ongoing need for reform. Two names were added to the indictment who we hadn't come across before, Hernan Lopez and Carlos Martinez, the former CEO and president respectively of Fox International Channels Latin America. What have they been accused of? So these were high-ranking executives of Fox. I have understood through sources that Hernan Lopez, who was a Argentine-American, he has citizenship in the U.S. and Argentina, was basically reporting directly to Lachlan Murdoch, who is, of course, Rupert Murdoch's son. So he was very high up the chain. They are charged with being directly involved in a scheme to bribe South American football officials over many years to win the rights to several football tournaments in South America, namely Copa Libertadores, which is the South American equivalent of the Champions League, and also Copa America, which is the South American equivalent of the Euro Cup, the Euros. So they're charged with paying bribes to get those rights and many millions of dollars of bribes. And the prosecutors detail just one cycle of bribes paid in 2015 as an example. That's the principal charge against them. It also says in the charging document that they use the relationships they built with these FIFA officials, these South American FIFA officials, to secure for Fox the television rights to the 2022 and 2018 World Cups as well. So there's a strong link between what they did, not just in Latin America, but also to the U.S. They were able to land important rights that here in the U.S. had belonged to ESPN for many years through the act of bribery. Both defendants from South America seem confident that they're going to be acquitted on the basis of a lack of evidence. Do you have any sense how likely a conviction will be at this point? It's early to tell, but you know, I would say that it's not unusual for people who are accused of a crime in this case to say they're not guilty at the outset. It's all happening so quick. That's the posture they might take. If I were a betting man, I would say there's at least a reasonable chance that they end up coming to a deal with the prosecutors. It's not common for people to go to trial. It's even less common for people who have good lawyers to go to trial on the federal level in the U.S. The prosecutors win more than 90 percent of the cases they take to trial. So they'll look at that. They'll say their odds are not good and they're likely to try to strike a deal. It doesn't mean they will. There's still a chance to go to trial, but I wouldn't necessarily bet on it. Have broadcasting rights made much of an appearance in the U.S. investigations before? Yeah, they were at the center of the case in the beginning because there's many crimes charged in the original indictments, which were much larger and more lengthy than this newest. I think the second indictment from 2015 was over 200 pages long. It was like reading a book, essentially. But many of the charges in there had to do with the negotiation of rights and bribes paid for them. So 
There was bribes paid for the Copa America and Libertadores, as I mentioned, and other tournaments in the Caribbean. There was vast bribery schemes having to do with World Cup qualifier matches. Same with Central America. So different media groups trying to buy rights and not wanting to you know, go through normal sort of public tender process, wanting to buy them on the cheap and sell them on the high end of the scale, they would pay bribes to officials for them to, to hand over the rights for a song. And that's a repeated pattern. What the case illustrated, that went back all the way to the at least the late 1980s, if not earlier. The football industry has never been more precarious at the moment due to the coronavirus. How much of an impact do you think this is going to have on FIFA in the wake of their ongoing trials? That's a good question. I mean, it's interesting to see where FIFA goes and how FIFA's reacted to this. I will tell you that FIFA's posture from fairly early on in the public aspect of the case is to call itself a victim. So FIFA cooperated with U.S. investigators, ran its own internal investigation, provided vast amounts of documents to American investigators, and routinely called itself in public a victim of the crimes. It requires a bit of flexibility and gymnastics to understand how the organization that elected all these people who ran it could be a victim of its own leadership, but that's what it's calling itself. The American courts have been a bit ambivalent about that posture. On the one side, they've let FIFA call itself a victim, and they have not charged FIFA itself with any crimes. But on the other hand, when FIFA was so bold as in 2018 as to ask for money from the U.S. government, FIFA asked that money taken from the people convicted in the case be given to it. And I think it submitted a request for well over $100 million to be given to it from the U.S. government. The court knocked that down to a much more paltry sum. The takeaway impression was that the government didn't feel they were that much of a victim. Going forward, I think FIFA, last week they already told me that they still consider themselves a victim. The real question that everyone is asking right now is what will become of the Qatar World Cup, whether Qatar will still be held as planned or not. It's really remarkable to see the incredible amount of evidence piled up that Qatar is a bad choice for the World Cup and yet to see FIFA continue to insist that that's where it's going to be. From what you're saying then, it sounds as though FIFA haven't really learned their lesson from this ongoing legal process. You know, I don't see enormous amounts of evidence. I see an uh, organization that's very oriented towards whitewashing problems and providing a, a beautiful face to the public on this without actually changing fundamentally its attitude towards transparency and governance, which is that the public doesn't really have a right to know what's going on within FIFA, and it's not interested in outside independent governance. It's interested in running itself as a, an elite club for an elite select number of people who get to enjoy all the perks of being part of this incredibly powerful organization. And I don't think fundamentally that's changed. I think FIFA still sees it that way. And don't get me wrong, I don't think it's easy for an organization like that to be run cleanly. Everyone's got their motivations. And when you have so many people with power within it, there's going to be political infighting and squabbling. But I think FIFA has shown no willingness to let outside help clean it up. I think it doesn't want it. You can read Ken Benzinger's investigative journalism at BuzzFeed, or alternatively, get hold of a copy of his book, Red Card, How the US Blew the Whistle on the World's Biggest Sports Scandal, which is out in paperback in the UK in the next few weeks. This episode was produced by Josh Schneiderweiler and Hugo Chambray. I'm John McKenzie. Thanks for listening to Football Today. If you enjoy this podcast, why not subscribe to our Patreon, where you can get hold of a raft of bonus episodes. Or, if you can't spare the cash, you can simply share an episode with a friend. See you next time.